Freedom in your computing begins in your own computer. That's not the whole of the issue, but that's, that's the first part of the issue. You don't have any freedom in your computer if you don't have freedom inside your, in your computing, you don't have freedom unless you have freedom in your own computer, first of all. And that depends on using exclusively free software, freedom respecting software that is, in your computer. <clears throat> So free software means software that respects the user's freedom and community. So it's free in the sense of freedom. We don't mean zero price. We're not talking about price at all. Whether you pay to get a copy or receive it gratis, that's a minor detail, a side issue that we're not interested in. We're interested not in how you get a copy, but in what that program does to you once you have a copy. Does it respect your freedom or does it take your freedom away? Free software is the only way to make your computer respect your privacy. Otherwise it's probably spying on you and sending data to someone else. After all, you're, you're interested in using encryption, obviously, to maintain your privacy. Okay, good. So, so, uh, one thing you can do to protect your privacy is pay cash. It's a technology more than 2,000 years old and it's still effective at protecting your identity. If you buy something in a store, what the hell? Saying something about a true tech portal, what in, I can't see the slides. Let's see if it, uh, no, I this is, that's the Wi-Fi. That's okay. I don't know what the hell this it's is doing, but can you get rid of it? Okay, good. So, it's really important for you to do this, for yourself and for society. There is a campaign to herd people into using payment methods that track them. If you learn to resent every time they identify you when you pay, then you will do what your privacy requires. And that is tell people, tell stores, no cash, no sale. Now, this means you should be prepared, carry money around. Make sure you carry money around. Make sure every day you've got enough money. If, but it's, if you want to buy something and you haven't got cash, well, there's a remedy. Go to an ATM. Because that way, although the bank knows where you were when you took money out, it doesn't know what you bought. So it's much better than paying with a, a tracked method of payment. <clears throat> and uh, where is, here it is. No, where is my coat? Could someone bring up my coat? Where is my coat? Thanks. Inside it there should be the red sweater. If you take out the red sweater, good. Because that has something important. This has another thing I do to campaign for privacy. It's a button that says, don't be tracked, pay cash. Now, someone here could make 50 buttons like this and start selling them for cash. And by wearing them, you will take a stand for privacy. Now, I don't just say this, I follow it without exception. I only pay cash to buy anything. I do use checks 
for things like uh, bills and so on where they know my name. But for products I buy in a store, cash only. If I basically, if basically, if I don't have to identify myself, I pay cash so that the payment doesn't identify me. Now, if at first you sometimes lapse, well, still better that you're doing it sometimes. So don't feel, oh, I screwed up, I made the mistake, I give up, I'll make the mistake every time. No, no but nobody's perfect. But every time you insist on paying cash, you're helping protect privacy. And we're going to need substantial resistance against the institutions that want to push people to stop paying cash and be tracked in everything they do. But, of course, our computing also has an effect on this. So, free software means software that respects users' freedom and community and so it's free in the sense of freedom, not in the sense of price. We often say Libra to make it clear what we mean by free. So what's a program and what's a computer? A computer is a universal computing engine, but really it's very simple conceptually. It only knows how to do one thing, get the next instruction and do whatever that says get the next and get the next and do each one. It'll get millions of instructions each second and do what the instructions say. The instructions come from a program, which is a collection of instructions. And depending on what's in the program, which instructions it has, it will make the computer do this or that or anything, anything at all, except for some things that are impossible. The program can't make the computer do this, but within the range of what can be done, the right program will make the computer do anything because of the instructions that are in it. So who gives the instructions to your computer? You might think it's you when really it's someone else. You might think your computer is obeying you when really it's obeying its true master all the time. So either the users control the program or the program controls the users. There's no other possibility. When the users control the program, that's free software. Why? Well, freedom is having control of your own life, control of the activities you do in your life. If you use a program to do the activity, control of the activity requires control of the program. So when the users control the program, they control their computing activities that they do with it, and thus it respects their freedom. Uh, practically speaking, control of the program requires the four essential freedoms. Freedom zero is to run the program any way you wish for any purpose. Freedom one is the freedom to study the source code and change it so the program does your computing the way you wish. Source code is sort of a mixture of English and math. If you, uh, if you learn the programming language, you can read it and see what it means and change it to do something else. But to run the program, it's typically converted into executable, which is a bunch of enigmatic ones and zeros. And uh, for a tiny program like this, it's not that hard to figure out what they mean, but a program that, that's real with like a million or 10 million ones and zeros, figuring out what they mean is terribly hard. People would only do it as a desperate last resort. So if you tell the users, here's this bunch of ones and zeros that you can't understand and you're free to change it if you can figure it out, that's a mockery of freedom. That's not respecting users' freedom. So we must insist that users get the source code. So these two freedoms give us separate control. Each user separately control over per copies. I'm using the singular third person gender neutral pronouns, person, per, and pers, because I simply cannot stand use of they in singular. So this way we can be gender neutral 
without sacrificing uh, our sense of agreement in English. So separate control is essential. It means I'm free to change my copies and you're free to change your copies. But that's not enough because most users don't know how to program. How are they going to participate in control of their software? Through collective control, which means the freedom to, uh, to uh, work together to change the program and make it do what a group of users want it to do. Uh, what? Um, so here are three users working together to change this program. Two of them are directly touching the code. The third one is not, but they're all discussing together what changes to make. This one on the left may be a non-programmer, but is still helping to exercise control over this program. This is how non-programmers can participate. Those who work together are those who choose to. There are two more users that are not working with those three. It's up to them. Those who wish to work together can do so, are free to do so. Uh, collective control requires two more essential freedoms. Freedom two is the freedom to make exact copies and then give or sell them to others when you wish. And freedom three is to make copies of your modified versions and then give or sell them to others when you wish. With these two freedoms, those users who wish to cooperate can do so. Also, anyone in the group can offer copies of the group's versions to others because these freedoms, they're not limited to some particular official group. The group is just whoever works together, whoever wants to cooperate at any given moment. So if you have a copy of a free program, you can make copies and distribute them to anybody. You can even publish it, which simply means offering copies to the public. So if a program carries these four essential freedoms, it's free software, it respects users' freedom and community, and thus it is distributed in a way that is just. But if one of these freedoms is missing or insufficient, then the users don't control that program. Instead, the program controls the users, and the owner controls the program, this is an injustice. So any non-free program is an injustice because it sets up a system of unjust power, power for the owner over the users. <clears throat> Thus, you shouldn't develop non-free software. Developing non-free software is making the world a less just place. It's creating injustice. It's better to do nothing at all than develop non-free software. This is the basic injustice of non-free software, but often it, it leads to other injustices because the developers know the power that they enjoy, and this tends to corrupt them. It tempts them to use that power to push the users down so that they can gain more themselves. That is, they put in malicious functionalities, hurting their own users intentionally because they've seen a way to profit from that. And one of the common malicious things is spying on the user. This example is the Amazon Swindle, Amazon's ebook reader, which spies on everything users do. It sends the title of the book to Amazon servers. So even if the book was obtained from someplace else, Amazon still knows that that book is being read. It sends the page number sometimes to Amazon. Uh, if the user enters any notes or highlights any text, it's sent to Amazon. Total surveillance of reading. But this is one example among hundreds. Someone checked the thousand or so most popular Android apps and found that uh, uh, I think 60% of the paid apps and 90% of the gratis apps were spying, meaning most of them. The four well-known proprietary operating systems, Windows, Mac OS, Android, iOS, and Chrome OS, they all spy on the user. 
And uh, of course, streaming apps tend to track what users listen to or watch, spying again. Uh, transportation apps identify the user like the streaming apps and uh, then keep track of where users go. This is why I would never consider being a customer of Uber. Never. Uh, Spotify's tracking of users disgusts me so much that I say, out, out, damn Spotify. And I won't listen to something through Spotify even if somebody else is playing it on her computer. I won't ride in an Uber car even if somebody else made the booking because Uber's strategy is to run at a big loss, losing billions of dollars in the hope of wiping out all competition, leaving us with no other way to get around, and then they'll raise the price and start to make money. Well, I had better be proactive about trying to defeat Uber. And so every time someone proposes to ride in an Uber car, I say, not me. And I hope you'll join me in defending your privacy. Uh, then there are the tethered devices, many devices, and physical products, and many programs are tied to a particular server. Well, the streaming apps and the transportation apps, like the Uber app, they're all tied to particular servers, and that's a way to track people. The products track people, too. The Fitbit sends somebody's personal data to the company, which then offers to sell it to the user. What goal? Uh, but when a product is tethered to a server, the manufacturer can turn off the server and make the product stop working, or turn off the account for that user and make the product stop working. And they re there really have been cases where a company said, we're not interested in this product anymore, switched off the server, and all those products stopped working for their users. You're basically putting yourself totally at the mercy of being mistreated completely. But in fact, any non-free program puts you at the mercy of its developer. And then there is DRM, Digital Restrictions Management. The infamous Blu-ray attacks users when they try to copy the data on the disk. Uh, and there's, no, there's currently no really sufficient way to break these digital handcuffs. So I've never used the Blu-ray disc. I've adopted the principle if a device, if a product was designed to attack my freedom, then I will never use it unless I have available what it takes to break the handcuffs. I recommend that same principle to you. My freedom is important to me. I would give up my freedom to see all the movies in the world. I'd rather say no. Then there are back doors. The Amazon Swindle has a, a back door for remotely erasing books. We know about this by observation. In 2009, people witnessed that uh, Amazon remotely erased thousands of copies of a particular book in a grand Orwellian act. I've met people who said they saw the book disappear as they were in the middle of reading it. It was on the screen and then poof, it's gone and the book wasn't there anymore. And what was the book? It was 1984 by George Orwell. You know, to really rub in the lesson you need to learn from this. There was a lot of criticism, so Amazon said it would never do this again unless ordered to by the state. If you've read 1984, that wasn't a very comforting promise. But it wasn't a promise anyway. It was just a meaningless noise. Uh, a few years later, Amazon returned to arbitrarily erasing books without even an order from the state. And then there's censorship. Apple was the pioneer in censorship of apps. The iPhone was the first general purpose computer on which users were not allowed to install freely the pro application programs of their choice. 
They could only install what was approved by Apple. And Apple practiced the censorship power arbitrarily according to its commercial interests and its political stances until last summer, at which point China ordered Apple to start banning VPN applications. And Apple discovered that since it didn't have the courage to lose the Chinese market, it was compelled to censor for China. And I expect in the next few years we'll see China censoring for Turkey and for Russia and for Pakistan and for India and who knows how many other countries with censorship. I wonder when it will start censoring for the UK. It's a country with a lot of censorship. Uh, when users find ways to get around the censorship, they call it jailbreaking. Effectively recognizing that this computer is designed as a jail for its users. <clears throat> Microsoft followed the same uh, example a few years later. Uh, there are also universal backdoors, which means a backdoor that can remotely impose changes in the software itself. So it's universal because it can do absolutely any nasty thing to that poor user. All the developer has to do is imp forcibly install changes to do the nasty thing and then let it run. There's a universal backdoor in Windows, first discovered in Windows XP. In Windows XP, Microsoft didn't admit there was a universal backdoor, but experts proved it by looking at output from various cases. In Windows Vista, Microsoft proudly announced this malicious functionality under a nice sounding name. It's called Auto Upgrade or Auto Downgrade, depending on your opinion of the change they force. <clears throat> so, basically, proprietary software tends to be proprietary malware. It's the usual case nowadays. Malware means a program designed to mistreat the users when it runs. It's about what the code does. Free versus non-free software is not about what's in the code, not directly. It's about how the code is distributed to users, respecting their freedom or not. So philosophically, these are independent, how it's distributed and what's in the code. Practically speaking, though, they go together, proprietary software and malware. Proprietary software tends to be malware because the developers have found ways to profit from making it malware. So that's what they typically do. Uh, there are we only know of a few hundred specific cases of proprietary malware. Look at gnu.org slash malware for lists of these. There are many thousands of other proprietary programs and mostly we don't know whether each one is malware or not. There are some examples that are malware and then there are all the rest where we don't know. And we can't tell either. With a proprietary program, there are two possibilities. Either it's known to be malware or it's not known. There's no way to find out either. You can't analyze the code of a proprietary program to see if it's malware. So the only way to trust it is blind faith. And usually it's blind faith in a company that's already mistreated users so you know it doesn't deserve faith. Whereas with free software, there's a rational basis for trust because you know there's a user community which checks parts of the code from time to time to add a feature or fix a bug and thus has a chance to detect any malicious code or any errors which are more common and fix it. And this means that users of free software have a defense against malware. It's the only known defense against malware. That is, for the program to be free so that the user community can check it and fix it. This is the only way users can have a rational basis to trust the program. Even though this defense is not perfect, 
it's a lot better than being totally defenseless like the users of non-free software who are helplessly at the mercy of the company that makes the software. So don't invite uh, someone to take advantage of you. Don't use proprietary software. What you should do is escape and join us in the free world that we have built with the GNU operating system and the Linux kernel, which work together. I started developing GNU in 1984. By 1991, GNU was almost complete, but one important component was missing, the kernel. In 91, Torvalds developed a free kernel, well, he developed a kernel called Linux, but it wasn't free in 1991. He made it free in 92. So in 92, it was possible to fit Linux, which had become free, into the last gap in GNU, producing an operating system that was basically GNU, but also had Linux. In other words, it was the GNU slash Linux system. I'm sure you know that people usually call it Linux, which means they're giving us none of the credit, even though we started the development and we did the biggest piece of the code, they give us no credit at all. I don't think that that's fair, so I ask you to please treat us right. Give us equal mention. Please call it GNU slash Linux every time you mention it, and that way you'll give Mr. Torvald some of the credit and you'll give us some of the credit too. We use that credit to urge people to think about their freedom and defend it. Now, in principle, GNU slash Linux is a free operating system, but in practice, and I'm sad to say it's not. Uh, because there are thousands of distributions, in other words, variants of the system, each with its own developers, and they decide what to put in uh, and there are thousands of distributions that are non-free, meaning s they contain some non-free programs, and only a few that are entirely free software. Look at gnu.org slash distros for the lists of the, for list of the free distros and other information about this. So, uh, if all you've installed is free software, you're still at risk of running some non-free programs because uh, you could, uh, well, if you browse a website, websites often send software to the user's browser in the web pages. And it, in, the browsers typically silently install and run the software. Now these programs can be free or non-free just like any other program. Some important ones are free, but lots of them are not. The problem is that if you don't do something to stop it, these non-free programs get installed into your browser and run. So we developed Libra.js, which is an extension for Firefox and also I think nowadays for Chrome, which will check the JavaScript code in these pages and block it if it's not either free or trivial. So it protects you from running these non-free programs, and some of them are malware. Some of them spy on the users. And that is included in our browser, IceCat. If you install and run IceCat, you're automatically protected in this way. Uh, another thing you need to avoid in order to have control of your own computing and not be spied on is SaaS, meaning server as a, service as a software substitute. The way to do your computing and have control over it is if uh, is to do the computing with a free program in your own computer. Of course, a non-free program takes away your freedom and it can spy on you too. But there are servers now, services, or you might call them disk services, that invite you to let them do your computing jobs. Of course, you have to send all the pertinent data, as well as some other personal data that the site may just demand from you for no obvious reason, and then it's spying on you. In addition, you don't control how that computing is done. You can't change it. So it's equivalent to running a non-free program, and for, your free, for the sake of your freedom and privacy, you should just say no. 
Now, one of the obstacles to the free software movement is the term open source. Why does the term open source exist at all? Well, there were people in the free software community that liked free software. Some even contributed, but they didn't like the fact that we present this as a matter of freedom, a matter of right and wrong. They didn't like the fact that we say a non-free program does you an injustice if you run it. They didn't like that because uh, business executives might not like it and they wanted above all to gain the support of business executives by never saying anything that might disturb them. And to talk about right and wrong, they just assumed that that would disturb business executives. So they coined their own term open source so that they could avoid using the word free and avoid ever hinting at any idea of freedom. And then they constructed a different discourse based purely on practical values, convenience. So they said, instead of saying as we do, if you develop and release a program, it's your moral duty to respect users' freedom and let them change and redistribute it, the open source people said, when you develop and release a program, please think about whether uh, it might be in your practical interest to let users change and redistribute the program. Th those people don't say it's your duty. They don't say it would be wrong if you didn't. They only say maybe it will be in your practical interest. So what they avoid, studiously avoid, is the idea that a user has some rights that a software developer is bound to respect. But most people agreed with them and the companies agreed with them. This was in 1998. Uh, and the politicians and journalists mostly followed the money and since then in the mainstream media and the tech press they only talk about open source. They never mention free software or freedom for users. So we have to struggle to make, the pub make ourselves known to the public to tell people that the free software movement even exists. And we work very hard to do this, as you see I'm doing it in this talk. But the misinformation has spread very far. Most people think that, most people who've heard of me think I advocate open source. And it's like saying that Corbyn started the Tory party. It's just not true. I've even seen articles that called me the father of open source. So I sent a letter to the editor. If I'm the father of open source, it was conceived through artificial insemination using stolen sperm without my knowledge or consent. Then I explain the name and the meaning of the free software movement. That's the serious point of the letter, but I like starting with a joke. So I do all I can. If you value freedom, you should help. And one way is don't say open source. Always say free Libra software. Show that you support the idea of freedom. Show people it exists. Anyway, uh, it's vital for schools to teach exclusively free software. First of all, the school has a social mission to educate good citizens of a society that is strong, capable, independent, cooperating, and free. In the computing field, that means graduating users accustomed to free software, ready to be members of such a society. And the school should never teach a non-free program because that's implanting dependence. It's just as wrong as teaching the students to use an addictive drug. Of course, the school shouldn't follow this policy mysteriously as if it were just some command uh, incomprehensibly imposed. No, the school should teach in every classroom the civic reasons for this policy so that the teachers and the students all understand why it's important for the school to do this. But schools also have to teach students to be good cooperating members of society.
Mm. To help others when there's an opportunity. So every class should have this rule. Students, if you bring software to this class, you may not keep it for yourself. You have to share copies of that program with everyone else in the class, including the source code, in case someone wants to learn, because this class is a place where we share our knowledge. Therefore, it's not permitted to bring non-free software to this class. The school, to set a good example, has to follow its own rule. It has to bring only free software to class and share copies, including source code, with those in the class. But there's also education in programming. Every program embodies knowledge. If it's a proprietary program, it denies that knowledge to the student. It's the enemy of the spirit of education and it should not be tolerated in a school. But if the program is free, then it offers its knowledge to the student. It supports the spirit of education. This is what schools must choose. They do wrong to their students if they bring, if they tolerate a non-free program on campus. And for those who want to, who have a talent for programming and want to develop that, the skill, they need free software. How do you learn to write good, clear code? By reading lots of code and writing lots of code. But only free software offers you the chance to read the code of large programs we use. And then you have to write lots of code. To get good at writing code for large programs, you have to write lots of code for large programs. But at the beginning, you're not good at it. You couldn't write a good large program yourself. You probably couldn't finish one. So how do you start writing code for large programs? by writing changes in existing large programs. At first, small changes, then bigger ones. Well, only free software gives you the chance to write changes in the code of large programs we really use. Any school can give its students the opportunity to master the craft of programming if it is a free software school. And they all should be. I'm sad to say that Schools are starting to violate students' privacy by giving them computers with non-free software that require the student to have an account with a company and demand that it be in per own name. And if the school tells a company the name of a student, even that much, that's violating the student's privacy. It shouldn't be allowed. It should be illegal for the school to inform any other organization of any information about a school except for transcripts of grades when the student asks for that to be sent. <clears throat> so human rights depend on each other. If we lose one human right, that makes it hard to defend the others. Now that we use computing for so many important activities of life, control of our computing, in other words, free software, has become one of the essential human rights that we must not lose. And that sometimes requires a sacrifice. People must be ready to make sacrifices for freedom. And fortunately in our field, that doesn't mean things like risking your life. It means accepting some inconvenience from time to time. But it's the same with paying cash. You may have to teach yourself the habit of having cash on hand. Although if you need to go to a bank machine and get out some cash, that's still a lot better than paying in a digital way. A lot better for your privacy. So go to the bank machine and recognize, oops, I made a boo-boo today, I didn't have enough cash. But each, the more times you catch yourself and have to go to the bank machine, the more you'll learn not to need to. And when you do pay cash and your friends are around, make it a teaching moment, explain why. 
If you make and sell buttons saying, don't be tracked, pay cash, you can do even more for the cause by wearing it and by selling them. So how to help our cause? Well, if you're a good programmer, contribute to free software projects. I suggest you do 15, you participate in 15 projects of others before you try to run your own. But most people are not talented programmers, so most people should contribute in the many other ways we need, like organizing political activity in the movement. It's like any other movement for human rights. It needs people to have activist groups that campaign for the rights, that have meetings, that invite speakers, that uh, collect dues and all those other things that you need to do in order to achieve something collectively. You need speakers. If you want to become a speaker, that's very useful. We also need the people who run the group, who don't have to appear in the spotlight, but are doing a job that is very important. We need to persuade schools and governments to switch to free software. For schools, look at gnu.org slash education. For governments, look at gnu.org slash government for a list of suggested policies. If you're good at using gnu slash Linux, help other users. That's an important contribution to the community. You could start a gnu slash Linux user group. If there's an existing gnu slash Linux user group, you can participate. If there's an existing GNU slash Linux user group that calls itself erroneously a Linux user group, you can go there and help other users and explain to people why the group should change its name. Because that makes a difference when users know about GNU. When they know the system they're using is GNU, and then they find out why GNU exists, then they'll start to think more about freedom. They'll, they'll recognize I owe this nice system to a bunch of people who worked hard for the sake of freedom. And say free software, because that's also a good way of making people aware of the issues. Every time you say free software is a time you didn't say open source. Now, I never use the term open source. I talk about it by putting it in visible or invisible quotation marks, but I don't use that term. That's a different philosophy that I don't, that isn't what I support. Now, where you stand is up to you. If you advocate the open source philosophy, you have a right to say so. And if you advocate the free software philosophy, you have a right to say so, and please say so. It's really a shame if you pretty much agree with the free software philosophy, but you never show this to other people. It's not enough for you to know it in your own head. What's really needed is to show others. <clears throat> now, free software, just because it's free, blocks <coughs> some kinds of surveillance. What the? somehow stuck onto this surface, strange. Uh, by the way, could I have some water? I'm very thirsty. Um, <clears throat> so the kind of surveillance that's done by programs that spy on you, you can block that by not running proprietary programs. It's, it's almost exclusively the proprietary programs that spy on you. But we can't entirely get rid of massive surveillance through this one method because there are other surveillance systems that don't work through proprietary software in your computers. Like when ISPs keep track of what sites you visit, well, there, the system that's spying on you is the ISP, which isn't your property, and you can't install different software in it, and you shouldn't be allowed to, it's not yours, but that doesn't mean it should be allowed to keep track of what you do, not without a specific court order to monitor you. <clears throat> and then there are the systems that exist only to spy on us, like the cameras in the street 
that recognize license plates or recognize faces. Now, this is, uh, this is soil for tyranny. The UK, over 10 years ago, set up a system of cameras by the roads to track all car travel. Everywhere cars went, it went in a database, and they could find, and the, the state could find any car in real time. And this has already been used for tyrannical purposes. For instance, some 10 years ago, there was a protest against a coal-burning toxic power plant that is helping to uh, destroy civilization. That's what burning fossil fuels does beyond a certain uh, quantity that the world can absorb. Well, some suspected protesters were uh, essentially arrested by thugs uh, on their way to the protest, or at least it was suspected they were on their way to the protest, and they were held without any charges till the protest was over and it was too late for them to participate. And then they were released. Apparently, they were not suspected of any crime. There was no charge to make against them. We understand what this was. It was use of surveillance power for tyranny. Now, I'm sad to say you can't stop that through any technology available to you. The only way to stop, to put an end to that uh, nascent tyranny is through politics. You've got a campaign for politicians that condemn this and will put a stop to it. In 1924, I believe, uh, the Labor Party had been elected and conservatives didn't want to allow that party to govern. So MI5 fabricated a letter from the Soviet Union offering support to the Labor Party. This was entirely fraudulent, but MI5 released it and it caused a big scandal because the public believed it and the government fell. So. Uh, sabotage by uh, state suppression agencies against certain democratic parties has a long history. I think it may be possible to convince the Labor Party to reduce the power of those agencies to mess with free expression and democracy.